Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. If you've ever had the misfortune of being the victim of a home burglary, or know someone else who has, then you'll probably know that the distress at the loss of possessions or valuables is often secondary to the feeling of violation that the crime creates. In most cases, things can be replaced, but what can't be recovered is the feeling of safety within the walls of your own home. Knowing that someone invaded the place when you're supposed to feel the most at ease in the world. Though these thoughts are frightening enough, what if the person who breaks in never leaves? Instead, choosing to reside somewhere within the walls of your former sanctuary, possibly without you ever finding out. While these cases appear to be extremely rare, they do happen from time to time. Today, we wanted to take a look at two such cases, where people lived secretly in people's houses for months, or even years, undetected. Before we get to today's stories, if you enjoy our videos, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel. And if you've watched a few of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. While you're there, don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. With that out of the way, here is part one of two people who secretly lived in other people's homes. At approximately 6 p.m. on the evening of October 17, 1941, a woman in Denver, Colorado named Jenny Ross told her family that she was going to check on their neighbor, Philip Peters. The 73-year-old retiree had been living alone at his house across the street for several weeks, after his wife Helen had taken a nasty fall the previous month and broken her hip. Like several others in the neighborhood, Ross and her family had offered to help Philip out with a few things while Helen was in the hospital, giving him extra time to make his daily visits there. This included providing daily breakfasts and dinners for Philip, for which he always showed up promptly. On this particular evening, however, dinner was ready, but there was no sign of Philip anywhere. When Jenny Ross walked across the street to the front door of 3335 Moncrief Place, her concern only deepened when she discovered that there were no lights on inside the house. Though her repeated knocks at the door went unanswered, she noticed what she believed were Philip's cane and hat in the hallway. At this point, she decided to alert a few other neighbors to the situation. After several people gathered outside the Peters' home, they figured that they would try to see if they could get inside. The front door was locked, so the group decided that they would try to gain access through the rear of the house. A woman named Doris Burke was lifted over the wall of the home's screened-in back porch, and was eventually able to get inside the house. When Burke entered and turned on the light in the kitchen, those outside heard two terrifying screams. They would soon learn why. Upon turning on the lights, Burke discovered blood on the kitchen floor and in various places on the ground level of the house. In the front bedroom, lying next to the bed, was the lifeless body of Philip Peters. Following the chilling discovery, the neighbors called the police, who quickly arrived on the scene. The investigation was led by Captain James Childers, who would later relate to the media several of the observations he and his detectives made during the initial days and weeks of the investigation. An analysis of the crime scene showed that Philip Peters had died from repeated blunt force injuries to the head. It was believed that the primary weapon used in the murder had been a heavy iron stove shaker handle a device that is normally used to shake the grates of a traditional stove while burning coal to make sure the ashes get to the bottom of the pan in order to ensure a complete burn. It appeared that the stove shaker had been wiped of blood and fingerprints, but a small amount of blood was still found on the shaker when it was examined at a lab. Investigators determined that a second weapon, likely some kind of older revolver, had also been used in the attack as pieces of what appeared to be a handle were found scattered around the crime scene. The whole bottom floor of the house was in disarray, suggesting that a serious struggle had taken place between Philip and his attacker. 
defensive wounds to Philip's arms, as well as one of his broken canes found at the scene further showed that he had fought back valiantly against his killer. As police considered the evidence, they arrived at two main theories of the case, that Philip was murdered during a robbery, or that he was murdered for some kind of revenge. This latter scenario made no sense to anyone who knew Philip or Helen Peters. Not only did the couple not have any known enemies, but Philip in particular was known as a kind and friendly person who was well-liked by his neighbors. The 73-year-old had worked nearly his entire professional life for the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad, eventually advancing to the position of auditor before retiring in 1930. For many years in his free time, Philip had been involved in a local club of Denver musicians for mandolin and guitar players. He had been well-liked there, too, playing the mandolin and helping to organize small shows and concerts across Denver. He and Helen had lived in their Moncrief Place house for the past 40 years, and their only child, Philip Jr., had long since married and moved roughly 250 miles away to Grand Junction. This seemed to leave robbery as the most likely motive behind the crime. However, here too investigators soon found themselves at a dead end. It appeared that nothing of significant value was missing from the Peters' home. Additionally, aside from the way that the neighbors had managed to force their way into the house, all other doors or windows to the residence appeared to be locked, so it wasn't even clear how a potential robber could have gotten in and out. Little did anyone know, the truth about what happened to Philip Peters was far more strange and disturbing than anyone could have imagined. While months passed with no new leads in the investigation, authorities remained determined to solve the case. Any police patrol cars traveling through the area were instructed to keep a close eye on the Moncrief Place property, and occasionally detectives would return to the house to see if there was something they had overlooked. However, they consistently failed to find anything of interest. In February of 1942, Helen Peters was released from the hospital and briefly moved back into her home, though returned to the hospital only a few weeks later after injuring her hip for a second time. She would come back to the house once again at the end of April, but by this point was mostly bedridden and confined to the second floor of the house. As a result, she required nearly round-the-clock care. However, Helen soon found it exceedingly difficult to keep steady caretakers and housekeepers employed at the house. Many would quit after only a few days, complaining of strange noises at night, including what sounded like footsteps. Some, like housekeeper Hattie Johnson, concluded that the Moncrief Place property was haunted and refused to return. Another woman, named Edith Clark, called police after seeing what she believed was a bony white hand reaching around an open door, followed by the sounds of fleeing footsteps. Like each time before, searches of the house revealed nothing. Two officers were even stationed in the Peters' home for two days and nights following Clark's chilling account, but they too failed to notice anything out of the ordinary. For her part, it appears that Helen Peters never heard any of the noises or witnessed any of the strange sights that her caretakers did. Some reports we read mentioned that she was hard of hearing, though it was said that she believed those that worked for her simply suffered from overactive imaginations, likely brought on by the knowledge of the grisly crime that had taken place in the house. Still, unable to find reliable help, and with her health continuing to decline, Helen eventually agreed to stay with her son and daughter-in-law in Grand Junction, and in mid-July left her home for a final time. Though the Moncrief Place house now stood vacant, this didn't stop the police from receiving eerie reports about so-called unexplained happenings there. Neighbors Mr. and Mrs. John Voss told police that some of the window blinds had changed position after Helen had left. Others reported seeing strange lights and mysterious shadows inside the home during the middle of the night. This only added to local fears that the house was haunted, leading to rumors about the so-called Moncrief Ghost. Then came the night of July 30th, 1942. It was a particularly warm night in Denver, and two of the detectives that had been working on the Philip Peters murder investigation 
Roy Bloxham, and William Jackson, decided to check in on the house. It's important to note that reports differ slightly here. Some say that the detectives broke down the front door after witnessing a curtain move, while others say that they were always going to enter the property, and instead became concerned when they heard what they thought was the faint sound of a door locking at the top of the stairs after they were already inside. Regardless, what appears to be agreed on by everyone is that once inside the house, the detectives followed sounds they heard coming from the second floor, quickly drawing them into a room that was being used to store old furniture, newspapers, and magazines. They opened up a closet in the room just in time to see a person's legs desperately scrambling up into a tiny hole in the ceiling. They grabbed the legs and pulled, causing an unknown man to fall down and back into the closet. The man was dressed in tattered clothes and appeared to be on the verge of starvation. While nearly six feet tall, he was pallid and emaciated, to the point where he was severely underweight. His exact weight is another area where reports contradict each other, but estimates range from a little over 100 pounds on the high end to just 75 on the low end. The man's smell was apparently unbearable. An examination of the hole that he was trying to climb into presented a further series of shocking revelations. Barely 8 inches wide and 15 inches long, the tiny concealed hole led to a similarly cramped attic space above the Peters' second floor bedroom. The space was 4 feet wide and between 7 and 12 feet long, and reached just 3 feet at its highest point. Inside, investigators discovered a heap of torn and tattered blankets on top of piles of newspaper that had been crafted into a bed. Cans of tomatoes, empty jars, bits of wire, and containers of human waste lined the hidden compartment. A radio set, a light, and an old toaster that had been converted into a makeshift hot plate were also recovered. Interestingly, so was an old revolver, the same one that was believed to have been used in Philip's murder. It was clear that whoever this man was, he had been living here for some time. However, it wouldn't be until police questioned him that the full extent of the horrifying situation would come to light. Though the man initially told police that his name was Matthew Cornish, after he was allowed to clean himself and was given some food, he revealed his true identity, 59-year-old Theodore Edward Conies. In an 8,000-word statement given to police on the night of July 31st, he confessed how he had come to be living in the nightmarish space in the Peters' home, and how he had been responsible for Philip's death. It turned out that Conies was no stranger to the Peters. In fact, at one point in time, they had been friendly with one another. Conies had met Philip as a young man after moving to Denver from Illinois. A sickly child, he had never been expected to live past the age of 18, and had supposedly moved to Denver sometime between 1907 and 1910 with his mother, partly for his health. Reports again contradict each other on how Conies and Philip met, but most say that they became friendly while they were both involved in the mandolin and guitar club. In fact, Conies told police that he had been over to Philip and Helen's house several times as a young man, before leaving Denver in 1917. After the failure of his advertising business and unable to get into the army because of his poor health, Conies had spent more than 20 years wandering across the United States, never finding much success. In April of 1941, Conies once again found himself in Denver, and by this time, his situation was as bad as it had ever been. He stayed in low-cost housing when he could afford it, but mostly, he was homeless. By September, Conies told police that he was so desperate, he planned to go to the Peters' house and ask them for some money or a meal, despite the fact that it had been well over 20 years since they had last seen each other. However, his plan abruptly changed when he got to the property and saw Philip leaving with a suitcase on his way to visit his wife in the hospital. From an alleyway, Conies noticed that Philip had left the back door unlocked and seized his opportunity. Once Philip was gone, Conies entered the house and immediately took what food he could from the Peters' icebox. He then proceeded to walk around and investigate, until by chance 
he stumbled across the small trap door in the upstairs closet. The space had no insulation, was completely unventilated, and was tiny. But still, Connie's concluded that it would be far better to stay there than to try and spend the winter out on the street. For five weeks, Coney stayed hidden in his makeshift attic home, initially only daring to come out at night when he could hear Philip snoring in bed. During this time, Coney said that he survived by taking what little food he could without being noticed, all the while trying to find the money that he believed that Philip had hidden around the house. Then, on October 17th, Coney's pushed his luck too far. Choosing to venture out of his hiding place when he believed that Philip wasn't home, he was in the middle of stealing food from the icebox when Philip suddenly sprang up from a nearby couch. Coney's told police that Philip did not recognize him and said that he was going to call the police. In a panic, Coney's grabbed an old revolver off the wall and began to hit Philip with it. As the struggle between the two men continued through various rooms on the first floor, Coney said he eventually switched to the stove shaker, which proved to be far more lethal. After the murder, he cleaned the weapon, grabbed what food he could, and returned to his hiding place, not daring to move a muscle for some time. Chillingly, Coney's told detectives that throughout the time that the home was occupied, he had routinely come down from his hiding place during the night to search for the Peters' money, often standing in their bedroom as they slept. He continued to look for the money even after he had murdered Philip, but he never found it. Apparently, the stashes of money did exist and were later recovered by police and given to Helen. Though he ultimately managed to remain concealed in the Peters' home for ten months, as time went on, Coney said his existence in the attic became more and more hellish. Despite his fears of getting caught, the periods when Helen lived in the home were actually better for him, because it meant there was food for him to steal when he got the opportunity. During the time when it remained vacant between Philip's murder and Helen's release from the hospital, Coney said that he had survived off of cornmeal as well as whatever canned goods and preserves were left in the basement. When the heat to the house was turned off, he nearly froze to death, and when the water was shut off, he resorted to drinking from the hot water heater, before eventually making trips outside under the cover of darkness to grab snow to melt on his makeshift hot plate. According to Coney's, this was the only time that he ever left the house during the ten months. Summer was equally brutal in the confined space, and without any ventilation, it was hot and the odors were powerful. This was something that detectives also noted, saying that searching the space after its discovery was almost unbearable. Still, Coney's chose to stay because he believed that he had left fingerprints behind everywhere at the crime scene, and that if he was arrested out on the street, it would only be a matter of time before investigators connected him to Philip's murder. He said that he spent his time reading, thinking, and listening to the radio that he had brought up from the basement. He was able to see, thanks to a light that he had rigged up using some of the wires that passed through the attic. Understandably, details of Coney's unbelievable crime and its aftermath quickly grabbed headlines nationwide. While some continued to refer to him as the Moncrief Ghost, he soon came to be more widely known by a different name, the Spider-Man of Denver, or the Denver Spider-Man. The name supposedly began to circulate after one detective remarked that a man would have to be a spider to stand living where Coney's was found. In an interview, Coney's was reportedly asked whether he liked spiders, to which he replied, Sure, I like spiders. They're friendly. People are cruel. At his trial in October of 1942, Coney's claimed that he had no intention of robbing and killing Philip Peters, and that he was simply surprised when he had been caught at the icebox. However, a jury disagreed, and on Halloween of that year, he was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. According to reports, following Coney's conviction, he lived out the rest of his days quietly at the Colorado State Penitentiary in Canyon City. He died in 1967 at the age of 85, where he was described as a forgotten man of the penitentiary. Despite the quiet nature of Coney's final years, one thing is clear. The story of the Denver Spider-Man 
continues to live on in the nightmares of those who will never forget the details of his chilling crime. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.